Welcome everyone to our third evening in this series of the Pocket Project at COP26, bringing trauma-informed leadership to climate change action. And we're really delighted to have you all with us. We're especially delighted to have Thomas Hubel with us. Thomas has just been slipping in and out of the space. His internet sometimes does that, but I'm sure he will be with us shortly. So I'm just going to invite Thomas a bit while we settle in the space. And maybe you can immediately start by taking the settling into the space quite seriously and finding yourself settling into your own space. Just with your breath, just more deeply into your own space, your body, your emotions, your mind, allowing more of yourself to come present into the here and the now. And also remembering your deep connection to the earth in this moment, taking a moment to honor the beauty of the earth below your feet, the preciousness, the beauty, and the fragility of nature surrounding you. Yeah, and also the beauty of the sky above us. And also maybe just taking a moment to acknowledge that we are here together to speak about these topics, climate change and collective trauma, the anatomy of inaction, Yeah, and, you know, we're here now at the 26th Conference of the Parties, where 200 nations come together to negotiate, to speak, to pledge together. And we're building on the Paris Agreement from 2015, where 195 nations signed an agreement with the intention of keeping temperatures below two degrees and at least 1.5 degrees. At the moment, scientists estimated, estimate that we're already at a rise of temperature of 1.1 degrees and we can see the results of that. More floods, more fires, sea levels are rising, people are losing their home. The first Pacific Island is due to disappear. Inhabited Pacific Island is due to disappear by 2040. Yeah, so this is the atmosphere that we're coming together in here on this call and also here in Glasgow at COP26. And there is a sense of urgency of commitment, an incredible sense of diversity, even though this is the whitest and most privileged COP of the past decades. And also there is a sense of real, um, hmm, a deep thrust towards change. And at the same time, many questions around pledges, agreements, and what is the actual implementation that we're seeing. Yeah, so we're really delighted to be here tonight with Thomas. Thomas Hubel is a renowned teacher, author, and international facilitator whose lifelong work integrates the core insights of the wisdom traditions and mysticism with the newest insights growing from science. Since the early 2000s, Thomas has been 
facilitating large scale group processes where he brings people sometimes up to a thousand more people together and helps us to bring coherence to ourselves, bring coherence to the group space, and then watch how unconscious pockets of energy start to come into our awareness together. So he very much started this work within the German Jewish conversation, which as you can all imagine, is a very painful and deep place to start and explored and learned about the process of collective trauma integration from the practice. And from these processes, the work has spread to include gender and women-based trauma, the trauma of racism, the trauma of colonialism, the trauma of genocide and war in other places, and the trauma of climate change, trauma and climate change. And that is specifically what we wish to explore here tonight. Thomas founded the Pocket Project together with his wife, Yehuda Tsasportas, to spread trauma-informed leadership and the knowledge around collective trauma integration that is develop being developed by this large group um, globally. In the last three years, the collective trauma online summits that have been organized by this field have reached out to more than a quarter of a million participants. And Thomas has also authored the book, Healing Collective Trauma, a process for integrating our intergenerational and cultural wounds, which we warmly invite you to take a look at. So Thomas, I hope- here. Yes, I'm here, Krishna. Wonderful. I am very I delighted to see you <laughs> at this very moment. Perfect timing. Thank you. Yeah. And would you like to just lead us into a little bit more of an arrival into the space before I bring some questions to you? Mm -hmm. Great. Over to you. So I will let to see myself here. Great. See you. Yes, hello and warm welcome everyone. Let's just take a moment um, together to arrive because we are coming all from different events and activities into this call. And we take a moment and just make a screenshot of how you feel right now. And once you, it doesn't matter, everything you find is great. Feel a bit stressed and tight or very relaxed and open. And then let your breath, especially your exhalations, take you a bit deeper into body sensations. So every time you exhale, you can prolong it a bit and or slow it down. And use the exhalation wave to connect to the live parts of your body. Just to check wherever your body is alive. And then to take a moment to see when you feel your body, a part of you is aware of that. I'm aware that I'm feeling my body right now. But what is aware? What is the awareness itself? 
just right now in this moment, not when we think about it, when we sense or feel the awareness or become aware of the awareness. And if you open your eyes for a moment slowly without disconnecting from your sensations and you take a short moment to look at your screen and since we're a digital community today, let's use your whole body. If you look at your screen with your whole body so I'm sensing with my whole body and I'm looking at who's here, getting a sense who's sitting here with us. The basics of human relation is I feel you and I feel you how you're feeling me. So I feel you feeling me. That's the basic building block of human relation. And we can practice that for a moment. I feel you feeling one of us. And that creates like a space together. It creates a coherent, more coherent space. Well, thank you. And, uh, I think that's good for now. We will do later a bit more just to get us settled here. Back to you, Kosha. But how do we want to start our exploration? I just need to come back to you as well, Thomas. So, um, yeah, I think it would be great to start just from the basics. So what is trauma? Where does it come from? And how does it co-create or shape our reality? Yeah, where it comes from uh, is uh, at least on some of our phones, see the story of the apple. <laughs> and uh, so let's not start where it comes from, but what it does. So when we say trauma is a not the experience when we go through a difficult experience. I'm talking about trauma is what happens in us when we, we are going through a strongly overwhelming experience, phase, series of experiences. Then there is an intelligent response that evolution developed, which means that if trauma is a moment where the computer gets overloaded, so there is there's two movements. One is extremely high stress, and the other one is a shutting down and a numbing. So suddenly we have two. The nature of trauma always creates two. And in between is a fragmentation. So I have a very high intensity of stress and experience. And because it's so overwhelming, in a part of the city, the light goes off. Which means, like, imagine you have a city at night and you, you shut down the electricity in a quarter of the city. So all the, all the part <sighs> comes dark. So one part of my nervous system goes dark. Which means I pull out the sensitivity and shut my sensitivity down. 
And it's very important because once I understand that, that the trauma response in itself is very intelligent, it's better than without it. And untaking care trauma response that hasn't been restored or integrated creates symptoms. Why? Because in follow-up moments after that, if similar situations or situations that just remind me of my overwhelm, I become extremely reactive or I don't feel anything. I'm indifferent, dissociated and numb. So I have these two forces in me, very reactive or very scared, fearful, overreactive, or I'm numb. I'm indifferent, I'm distant. And, and I think, and a part of myself, I can't feel anymore. I can feel a certain part of my body. I can feel a certain fragrance of my emotional experience. And, and I can feel you in a certain part of you. Because trauma hurts our relational capacity. So the, the relational movement, I feel you feeling me, is being reduced or fragmented and shut down. And one consequence is that subjectively, I feel more separate. I feel more separate. I feel more alone. I feel more distant. And so separation is a trauma phenomenon. But disembodiment also. So when I ask you at the beginning, when you make a screenshot of your body, and then you, you drop deeper into your body, you can connect to your body where you feel yourself. You can also connect kind of to your body where you feel yourself just a little but you cannot connect to your body. And maybe you don't even know that you don't feel yourself in certain areas of your body where you are numb or I, everybody. And so the reason why we also bring this into the climate change conversation, because the evolution and development are capacities of movement relating to each other are capacities of movement. When I feel you and I listen to you, I create a synchronization so that my nervous system and yours create a more coherent relational space. But where, so these are capacities of movement, but trauma is a reduced movement. Trauma is reducing the movement of life because it's freezing. And we all know this when we run, when we say part of my life is more difficult or I had a difficult situation or I had a difficult interaction with somebody. That's where we feel the reduced movement. And that's why even if you are very intelligent, we cannot solve certain situations or parts of our life. Not because we cannot, but because of the triggers that come up. And, um, and the other one is that Trauma didn't start with us. And that's, I think, where collective trauma comes into being. Trauma was here thousands and thousands of years. All of us have been born into like a pre-traumatized world. And so detaching trauma from a merely personal experience so trauma is what happened to me when I was three or when I was seven or when, I, when somebody had a car accident. So then something happened and I can connect my biography to my trauma. And a lot of the trauma work that we see at the moment is centered around that. But what I have seen in, in the last 20 years in all those bigger facilitation processes that we did around large scale wounds, as Kosha mentioned before, I see, wow, the, I have been born, I grew up in Vienna as a boy in post-World War Vienna. 
And nobody told me that the atmosphere that I felt, a certain kind of interactions between people, how people behave, how people um, interact with each other, certain feelings in society or processes in society, that all of that is going back to frozen aspects of life. So I grew up and said, ah, that's, how life, that's how life is. Until I learned, no, Thomas, this is not how life is. There's one part how life is, that's true. But then there is another part. And that's how life is when it's hurt. That's different. If we normalize trauma, we normalize repetitive processes that are actually living in the past. And then we complain about them because we say, you see, it repeats itself over and over again. But if I know, if I see that I'm complaining about something, let's say with my wife, I have the same relationship argument again and again, periodically. I know we are stuck in the past. We are not talking now. My trauma and her trauma have a marriage. Mm -hmm. And then that moment of friction, but we know that moment because we had that moment already 10 times or 20 times already. When that happens, it's not fresh and it's not even happening now. It's my past interacting with her past, creating a past conversation. It's not emergent. It doesn't arise out of this moment. It's not happening in presence. And trauma is bound to repeat. Freud's repetition compulsion, it's, it's bound to repeat itself because it's un, partly unconscious and it has no future until we become aware of it. So normalizing social traumatizations like big wounds or trauma that existed in our societies already has been passed on from one generation to the next is is a systemic issue. So from it being an issue of one person with a therapist, which is also true, it becomes a social issue that concerns all of us because trauma exists all over the world and it exists over a long time. Look at Europe and its wars, look at the US and its history, look at Asia, look at everywhere basically. We, we are living in a normalization of systemic trauma factors that are partly running the show without us knowing. And I think that's why the frozenness in our social structures, we are still arguing with its symptoms often. And it's actually for us important to go to look where is the fire, like not where is the smoke, but where is the fire? If I see repetitive processes in politics, if I see repetitive processes in social structures or in economy or in big systems, that's a, that's a symptom. Where is the fire? And I think that's why um, the responsiveness of the society to an obvious threat needs to be seen, in my understanding, needs to be seen also, not exclusively, but also through the lens of collective trauma, because trauma doesn't want to change. Its nature is to freeze. So if there's an enormous change process coming towards us that we, in our fluid nature, we are able to change because the structures of consciousness are fluid. So we build them, we use them, and when they are not anymore uh, fulfilling their purpose, we open them, recycle, and we change them. That's adaptability. But in trauma, I don't have adaptability. It even scares me to change. So, and if somebody pushes me, like an activist, I push against it because it scares me even more. And that's the conversation I think that we wanted to have. So this is a short, I know it's a, 
it's a big topic for a short answer, but that's along the lines where we want to keep our conversation going today. Yeah, beautiful. And, you know, for me, especially what you just said about the way that trauma freezes our structures. And it feels like, you know, for sure, as if climate change grows out of frozen structures. And right now we're struggling with the frozenness of those structures and our lack of adaptability. Um, yes, yeah, so I'd love to hear more about how collective trauma feeds into climate change, how it co-creates climate change. And maybe I could just share something here, you know, that Vandana Shiva brought in one of the panels that I was always on, also on, um, about the way that earth systems or earth intelligent created atmosphere, which has touched me. So she said that before life on this planet, the atmosphere of the earth was 98% carbon. And through the incredible technology of photosynthesis and the creation of life, um, through photosynthesis, carbon was slowly taken out of the atmosphere and sequestered into the soil. Until today, we have an atmosphere of only 0.04% of carbon in the atmosphere. So that this creation of life and the utter abundance of life created an atmosphere that was conducive to life over millions of years. And it's amazing to think of that, how life co-created itself in this abundance and how humanity has been able in a period of around 300 years to um, yeah, to burn up so much of that sequestered carbon and yeah, bring it back into the atmosphere um, without understanding what we are doing in the bigger picture and how long it took us to understand. So yeah, that's a bit of a long introduction from my side, but I just love to know more from you about this yeah, the, the bite out of the apple or how we fall out of that creation that we do, no longer hear the information that we need to receive to live in a responsible way on this planet and how hard it is for us now to adapt our structures. Right. And, but the good news um, is that I think once enough of us become aware of the symptoms of trauma in personally, but also systemically, how, how some of the structures in our society are made out of ice. They're not made out of movement. They are made out of reduced movement, repetitive movement or the past that is perpetuated. And so the more of us systemically that are able to witness those trauma structures and detect it for what it is, like become aware of it, it will incredibly speed up the process of change. Because let's, let's use one example. The Let's say you, Kosha, right now, when I look at you, you inform me. What does it mean? It's in formation, which means when I look at you, you are living already in my central nervous system because the Kosha that I see is already in me. Kosha that I see happens in here. 
And the Thomas that everybody sees right now happens in you. Your perception shows you a Thomas, but the one that you see is in your brain. But it's already very interesting because we inform the world in form. We create a form in each other. We have the power to create a form in each other. And, and we let ourselves be in formed. Sometimes the information stays up here. I'm very well informed, like I know a lot about what's happening in the world, but I'm not able to feel what's happening in the world because it's too much for me. So then the information goes up to here. Or I hear something, I understand it cognitively, I can think it, I can sense it, so it makes sense, and I can feel it in my body. I can have a representation of it in my body. So when I feel you, I feel I can allow you in me as deeply that my body feels your body pretty precisely. That's a matter of being informed. But often we are not really informed because we, we hear information cognitively, but we don't allow it into its embodiment. But what is my body? My body is millions of years, as you said before, of life. My body is not just 50 years old. My body is millions of years old. And all that wisdom is in cells being able to form tissues and organs and nervous systems and the more complex emotions and complex thinking. And so when we are sitting here, we are looking through all of that. And I think one important aspect is that if we, through our embodiment, become aware of the trauma that's also in the room, and we, we start sensing that, not just we know that there must be trauma in the room. No, that it's something we start to feel. Then the system of us have, starts to create the systemic witnessing or awareness. And the second part, I think that's important is that when we are being informed about climate change, we also need to be willing to embody climate change so that it creates a cognitive, an emotional, and a physical care. But if part of my body is hurt because of my trauma, my grandparents' trauma in the war, or the, my society's trauma, and the information cannot go in, I can also not I can also not expand into into a a deeper response ability because in order to respond to you kosha I need to feel you when climate change cannot come in and embody itself through me I will not develop the responsiveness and the feedback capacity that nature around me needs within me to respond to its change. So it will create a delay. And I think becoming aware of what creates the delay is like taking a moment to reflect on that it's not just the stupidity of the society or the laziness of the society, there is something else going on that the permafrost of our cultures needs to be seen and respected as that. And then we will be more and more skillful to work with it and support it into a movement. Because if I create a pressure onto a trauma in a person, I create a resistance, I get a backlash. The person will retreat, the person will contract, the person will walk away or will stop feeling. So that's not the skillful intervention. 
and and I think we are about to learn how to do this systemically with social, with much bigger social systems. Yes, yeah, so I'd I'd love to come with two more two questions in response to that, and one is just as you say, you know, about this pressure creating in a way a pressure on a trauma where it's frozen. And at the moment, it feels like that creates like two such contradictory movements. You know, we're here at COP, we have like, this is the last moment we have to take all these important decisions. You know, it's a runaway climate change, countdown and tipping points. So there is an incredible pressure to speed up change and a pressure on each other. You know, everybody's saying that everybody else is not moving fast enough, you know. Um, and on the other hand, to actually bring the compassion and the embrace to these places requires a slowing down. And it, you know, it feels like two different movements that are not, you know, it's, it's, it seems like it needs a miracle for them to meet. Right. We need to be able to discern what's the original movement, what's the authentic movement. And then there are two, there's the reduction or the numbing, and then there is the hyperactivation or the stress. So sensational media will trigger either the stress or the numbness. So sensational media will hit the, the, the overstress or the numbness. But good media is going into the authentic core where it speaks deeper to me and my capacity to respond or to the part of me that is responsible, that is able to respond to the situation. And on the other hand, it's also very important that there is an urgency. How can we be within the urgency and not within the hyperactivation. So that's interesting. How can we be within the urgency and not get enrolled into them? Because once I understand trauma deeper, I see that them is part of, is a trauma symptom. It's very easy to say they are not doing it or they are like this or they, but where am I when I'm saying that? What's the process of deming <laughs> them? What's that process? What creates this in me? And so my distance from the others is part of the other ring. And if I, if I engage in it, I start to be part of the fragmentation. So it needs a high speed. It's very tempting because the nature of fragmentation is that it enrolls fragmentation. It's very easy to project stuff on other people because it's so easy because if it's disconnected in me, I will see it on your face. And the same is also true for, um, for fragmentation. So how can I be in the urgency and follow the calling that I have, that I am passionate about climate change, but not to get enrolled in the other ring? Because in the other ring, I create my own enemies. And then I have to fight them because they will fight me because nobody wants to be othered. And in that mechanism, I get stuck. So how to be clear without othering? Because then people say, yeah, but then I can't say anything. No, that's not true. I can be very clear about my mission without othering. And, and I think that's an art because once I understand that in the nervous system, every traumatic impact creates two. And as I said, the two-ness didn't start only with us. I, I inherited already some, some of it from my ancestors too and their history. And we inherited a lot through colonialism, for example, or through, you know, through, the, through racism and slavery. We inherited a lot of that othering and that trauma fragmentation already. We, have, we grew up in it. 
And it's so it's like it's like the music that our nervous system is used to. And it needs a lot of awareness processes to detect it, not to judge it as bad. I shouldn't have that because that's the same process. And, and to say, yes, I, I become more aware of that. I, I, I can't suppress it, but I can't choose not to engage in it and, and choose something else. And, and I think that's very, that's very important if you want to if you, if you want to start, as Otto Sharma says, to, to develop a system sensing capacity, like system sensing means that I start to become aware and be able to sense the system as much as I can think about it. And, and to combine these two, two senses as a kind of a coherent uh, processing. Yeah, so I think that that's very important. These are a few things that we all are called to practice because it's not so easy because we're all affected by it. We grew up in it. So some of us more, some of us less, but it's we are affected by, by that fragmentation. And that's why it's so easy to join like certain styles of conversation, even certain styles of political conversations they are completely caught up in that process. And I believe it's a waste of time. It's like, it's not only a waste of time, it adds to the problem. And what I notice while you speak about, you know, how trauma infuses polarization and speeding up, how there is a part of me that is so joyful about COP26, you know, that there's a part of me that really, even though there is a lot of hyperactivation, also just in watching Anna and me navigate the floor and conversations that there are more, you know, it feels as if there are more and more people who bring together this practice of spaciousness in the moment and urgency that there's not just hyperactivation there there's a lot of presence there and also that you know not only 200 nations coming together even if it's not fair you know if there's not equal representation but these nations are here and we have the nations sitting at tables speaking about their contribution to the world what their country is bringing mm. and you know, we don't just have the governments, but we have all the other voices at the table, the non-governmental voices, the, the corporations that are having a huge voice, you know, that just pledged over $135 trillion of investment in zero carbon technologies in the world. You know, there is a big movement coming from that world. And also that we have more and more voices of, spiritual practices coming in to the space, indigenous ritual coming into the space, youth coming into the space. So there is a lot of, you know, trying, you could say trying to bring the threads together, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, it is the thing of beauty. And in that there is a lot of limitation and that limitation feels like it's, it stays invisible somehow. And I wonder whether you could speak more to the, the invisibility also of the what is keeping us apart. I mean, in a way, you already spoke about that when you spoke yeah. about it, but I'd love to yeah. hear about it. Right. First, I want to say something like when you say you feel a joy, because it's amazing when we all come together to care for something that's meaningful. With all its problems and all its difficulties, it's beautiful to celebrate that enough come together and we are trying our best, obviously that's our best, to, to come together and take care of something that we feel is needed and right. And so 
to honor that, that including all the difficulties and everything that can go wrong and doesn't work, there are these efforts of a concentrating force. Coming together is concentrating. That's very important. Gathering our tribe, like gathering together, like the drums that gather everybody together that hears the drum beat is a concentrating force. If you want to create a movement in the world, that's what we have to do. We, at a certain point, when the, the intention of the movement is clear enough, we need to gather our tribe. We need to bring together the resonances and the synchroniz synchronization that's needed to form a movement. And when the movement comes together, like at COP26, it's the whatever, climate movement, it's it's joyful underneath, and it's important to recognize that and to also celebrate that with all the difficulties and all the criticism and all the other stuff that's on top of it. Because that's our resource. When I said before, feel your body and feel your body where it's alive. When we feel the body where it's alive, I believe we don't feel just our body being alive and the blood streaming through our body and the nervous system being open enough to sense it. And when we feel where we are alive, we feel integrated history. Because integrated history, in my understanding, is not behind us, but in us. It lives as us. Millions of years of history living as this moment. This is it. This looking, listening, speaking, being here. These are millions of years looking, listening, feeling, sensing, pulsing. So integrated history is flow. Flow is concentration. concentrated history. It's the wisdom of all our ancestors that went through difficulties, droughts, wars, all this, and survived it, apparently enough that we are here today. So that the going through disruption, repairing it, going through disruption, repairing it, sits deeply in our body. The resilience is also here. So that's one thing. The other thing is that when I, 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 I need that concentrating force because there's another force that I can't feel. And that's the dispersing force. Trauma is dispersing, fragmenting, cracks in the window. And so we, we are living, all of us, in these two forces. And we know this in our life. There are certain parts in our life that are very on, that are very flowing, they're very easy. They're very, and then there are other parts that are repetitively challenging, let's call it, or difficult. And in the one, I feel the force of concentration. In the other one, I feel the force of dispersion or fragmentation. And the interesting, the interesting skill now to develop is that a lot of the invisibility is in the not feeling. And I believe we are not very trained, A, to honor that if a person is overwhelmed, if a child is overwhelmed and doesn't feel, not feeling is better than feeling. And it happened to us many times in our own development because often as grown ups, we don't understand what's already overwhelming for a child because we judge overwhelm as we see it, not as the child sees it. 
And, and the other part is that when the not feeling is not a dysfunction, it's a function to protect ourselves. The people that are the most stressed are the people that are not talking anymore. The people that are the most stressed are the ones that are mute in our society. These are the people that are the most hurt. The people that can still scream and the cameras are coming and filming it. It's, there is more energy than the mute pain that has no, that has no voice anymore to call for help. And in, the, in that numb place, in the absence, we stopped feeling. We stopped feeling ourselves. We stopped feeling our body. We stopped feeling everything that's connected to it. And we also stopped feeling our environment. And being able, and I think that's a high level consciousness work, because it's easy to be aware of what we're anyway aware of. <laughs> but to expand our awareness into the areas that we can't feel, but they are there, they're here. That's an art. That's the art. So when I talk to a person and I feel the person is for a moment emotionally not present, and I take a breath, and I give a moment of integration to allow for the person maybe to catch up, it's much better than to keep talking. Because if somebody is overwhelmed and I keep feeding information into that person, it's not gonna help. It's just overload the person more. That's relationally unskillful. But if I don't feel that the person is not anymore available, so I keep on talking. So it means I don't feel the person, I feel only myself because I don't feel where you are. I don't include you anymore. So we see people sometimes talk to other people, but the other person is already not there and the person doesn't recognize it. And, but if I, if I become more aware how numbness plays in me, and that numbness is not the thing that shouldn't be there, but it's the thing that needed to be there given my life circumstances. Then we develop a sense for absence. And in order to do good trauma work and to do good collective trauma work, it's, it's a must to train our sense for absence. Because once we can witness absencing to a certain degree, it's not anymore an unconscious absencing, it becomes a conscious absencing. And in that moment, it has a future. Everything that's being brought back into the light of the day like into the light of conscious awareness has a future. Everything that's drowning in the, in the lake, which means it stays unconscious, it has only the past. It's bound to the past, it repeats the past, and it has no future. And, and I think that's, that's an important, like the concentrating force is exactly the, the opposite. The concentrating force is what what brain coheres and what coheres also social systems. And that coherence is our power to respond to the current situation. But the other side is also true. And I think we need to gain more capacity how to become aware of the force of fragmentation. If something doesn't work, there's always something at work that it doesn't work. That's very important. I can look at, oh, it doesn't work. Or, hmm, what's actually working for it to not work? There's nothing that doesn't work. 
there is only there are processes that I don't understand that lead up to the fact that it looks like it's not working. So I want to do something, but I hit difficulty. So what is the diff what is this? What's the composition of this? And I think for the climate change uh, efficiency, for the change efficiency, it's very important for us to gain more access to that which looks like that's the problem. Like that's the problem why it's not working. And that's what we need to get more uh, awareness of. That that's not stupid, that's intelligent. And I need to, but I, I can't yet fully grasp the intelligence. Once I, I make the intelligence my ally, movement's gonna be restored. We see this with every defense mechanism in a, in a client. When, when there is a defense mechanism, the mechanism is highly intelligent. So we can't not not have it. So if we, if we have it, so let's make it our friend and let's use it as an intelligence in the process. And I think the collective defense mechanism, because we have to see that if, for example, let's take Germany now, if we were to take off or also Israel where I'm right now, if we were to take off the collective unconscious, and we would see everything, millions of people will go psychotic. It's not just that it's a mistake that it's there, it's there for a reason. The numbing and the shutting down and the suppression and the, like having 6 million people in concentration camps, is an incredible amount of pain. That's not something we can just say, oh, let's see it. <laughs> no, we cannot let see it. It's, it, would over, it would burn our nervous system. It, it needs to be titrated back into consciousness. And 400 years of slavery and racism are an incredible amount of pain. I cannot just be lifted. So I think that's why I think that the amount of energy or intensity of life that we are talking about when we talk about these things, that's enormous. Yeah, and I think I can feel it even here in the space right now, you know, it feels like the chat is very active and many people writing and it's you know even like this sense of um trusting that all is well you know that's the sense that really at the moment in terms of climate change is so hard to you know it's not with us like um as you just spoke about the intensity of the pain in the past. And then if we come to the intensity of the pain that is currently experienced in the world, the suffering that is here and now, the suffering that is happening in the natural world, it's also, you know, it's the same, like it's too intense for our nervous system. And I feel like that is also triggered in a way by COP26, you know, and the experience of many people, many voices being excluded, many NGOs, many people from the world not being able to be here, their voices not being heard. So, you know, before we were speaking about concentration coming together, and of course, there's also exclusion. I just want to honor that here also. And just the, yeah, the sense of activation that connecting to that pain brings up in our systems right now, right here. Yeah. Yeah, and I know, Thomas, that you also wanted to lead us into a deep attunement, and then we wanted to hear some voices here or bring some questions in. So maybe it's time to move. Yes, maybe. 
Um, Maybe we can just uh, be a space because everything everything starts from you know the willingness the willingness to engage and I don't need to know and have all the answers ready but I'm I'm willing to be here and I'm willing to be part of it why because I'm alive and I'm alive in this time. So if I'm alive in this time, I'm willing to participate in it as, as much as I can. And we can just look at how the, you know, many things that we shared, like what it leaves you with, what's the feeling in your body right now, What's your emotional experience? And to allow every fragrance of emotional participation. And also notice if things are too much. For example, you can't really tell what emotion is present right now in you, then that, that's equally valid. Sometimes if you feel overwhelmed, we feel overwhelmed. And that's okay. And then I would love us to get a sense of the root system, like your ancestral system. If you take a moment and say, okay, if I connect to and I feel into my ancestors, that there is a context to me as an individual. I just didn't appear here. I'm part of a many, many, many generations. Long context. And there is a resilience that has been passed on to us, as much as also some of the pain of our ancestors rests with us. There is also strength. There's integrating disruptions and harvesting the learning to grow our perspective. So integrating trauma leads to post-traumatic learning and growth. And that happened already many times before. my ancestors and the root system goes back into the planet to 
the substance of the planet. Also, we are the biosphere. We are not on the planet, we are the planet. And then slowly let's take a deeper breath. Slowly come back. Oh, still a little time for some questions or statements or any comments. Yeah, so maybe we just start with you, Eric, and I would ask you just to keep your question quite essential so that we can give space to people. Yeah, thank mm. you. Over mm. to you, Eric. Yeah. Yeah, I feel a lot of tender emotion in the moment and uh, really appreciating what this is illuminating in me is the quality of say the activist who wants to change and that othering and I feel like it, would, it took me really deep into all the places this is happening not just with climate change but the whole range of uh, issues of polarization so uh, this feels like a walking question I don't know if there's an answer but perhaps guidance on how do I more and more look at the ways that I'm contributing to the problems of polarization through my own activist orientation. It's like how to handle that urgency. And you're talking about, you know, there's this tension between the urgency and numbing. And then, you know, here I am. And yeah, it's like getting clearer. I don't know if that's as well formed yet as a question, but it's like, there's a, uh, there's a real sense of being humbled at how much I get in the way and that desire to be more responsive and available. So perhaps enough in there. And you can respond. Thank you, Eric. First of all, good to see you. 
and uh, um, I think we And what I'm going to say now doesn't apply to, or most probably is hard to apply to uh, criminal or very violent uh, situations, but I'm talking about more daily life activist or daily life situations that I think distancing is a very interesting phenomenon. that in in my work i call this like the 2d version and i will say something that it sounds a bit drastic now but i think it illuminates it very well um when when we say the nazis then It's, it's kind of much easier for us to create a poster of them that makes it easy for me to project kind of the evil force onto that poster. It's a 2D poster. But if I allow that the Nazi, the guy that worked in the concentration camp was a loving father and maybe husband, then it's already a bit more complicated. Because if I, if I have to deal with the complexity that something very dramatic is happening, and on the other hand, it's challenging me because it's not a clear cut black or white. It's much more complex than that. Then if I allow that to become a 3D, like an embodied experience. 3D is embodied. I can feel it. I can feel it. 2D is disembodied. It's just, I can, it's like a poster. And um, so, and I'm saying this because when we other others, when there are groups in society that are for sure the others and they are for sure wrong, the question is not that I need to agree. I can deeply disagree with the way of living or with the way of whatever, how things are. But it, the question is, what's my relational experience? And if my relationship experience is distanced, then there is a part in me that cannot compute that, whatever that is. And I think that's an interesting question. So when I check in my experience, how close do I feel to something or how distant do I feel to something or to a group of people or the others or the ones that I don't agree with or, you know, like you see it in COVID or you see it in all kinds of uh, othering moments. And so I think that the that checking on myself not whether I agree or not. I can have a strong disagreement with somebody in relation. But it doesn't mean that I disconnect from the experience of that person. And the re-traumatization happens in the disconnect from the experience of the person. Not in the disagreement between how we see life. And I think like the relational uh, experience is a key factor in data transfer because relation is the data connection. If I talk to somebody from the distance, how can I expect that the person will really listen to me because I'm not, I don't even feel the person. But if I am able to be with somebody that I disagree with in a kind of closeness, then whatever I have to bring in the room has at least the highest potential of our chemical uh, power. And also what the person brings to me will be something that I listen to. 
even if I disagree with it. And then there is a different flow of information because somehow two polarized opinions or ways of seeing things are in the same room. And they can either stay separate and then they will just walk away and talk about each other badly, or they, they can be in a space where at least some sort of alchemy happens between these seemingly polarized forces. And I think we can all contribute, not that it shouldn't be distant, but that we are aware that it is. That's the beginning. Not saying, ah, I should be, I should be intimate with the whole world. No, we are not intimate with the whole world like this. That's an illusion. But that I'm more process aware of how it is, that's where I would start or start. That's where I would continue the work. You're not starting there, but yeah. Because that's something that I can feel like, is the other close to me or is the other distant? And how am I talking about the other? And I think these are very powerful practices in the, um, also in the, in the way how we engage in life, especially in fragmented political or whatever other arenas. Thank you, Eric. So anybody else uh, wants to share something or? Thank you, yes. Yeah, we have Nela, but she's not able to turn on her video. And I, is that That's okay? okay or? Yeah, good. So Nela, we'll go with you. Oh, okay, do you hear me? Yes, I do. Okay. Thank you. I have a, uh, I like to do a sharing. Um, I feel it so deep inside to share it since many, many years. Um, and I wrote it in the chat and I just want to say it again. I feel this strong um, visualization of Mother Nature mirroring our own our own inside so there's no so no separation from inside and outside and nature simply mirrors us where we are and if we are not connect to our own nature nature will show it to us in all the ways he she can and all this also all the pain in my vision is part of the whole journey and process. Um, so I want to inspire and motivate. I feel it's on each of us. I lived with nature for three years now. It make me it not only feeling better to be in tune with nature, it made me more healthy, it made me more vital. I need nearly no money. Um, I just want to inspire you for whoever is able to start something like this, try it out, uh, be it with a garden, be it, yeah, just follow your true nature inside, follow this path for your own, don't wait for the outside, because it's on you to change the whole field. And there's a question we can ask is, what stops us from living our true nature? So what is our true nature? But for me, true nature is to grow my food in the garden, for example. And as I did it, I had all my food in the garden, but I was not hungry anymore because already the tune within Mother Nature, within Source itself, um, nurtured me. So it's on an, a totally different dimension and frequency. And yeah, I just wanted to share this experience and also give past this question on what stops us from living our true nature. And usually these are fears connect to the trauma. And this period of Corona is also a mirror to that. It's showing us the pain uh, of, insecurity, dealing with health, dealing with money issues, 
and really mirroring this existential needs and crisis to come back to our nature and to understand that Mother Earth carries us. And this illusion of we need a lot of money, we need this, we need this, is an illusion. And to wake up to that makes it so easy to live in and with nature. Mm. And yeah, that's my sharing. Thank you. Um, I hope it was not too fast or too long. Mm -hmm. I felt it so much. Maybe it's it's already clear for you. Maybe not. Feel welcome to write me. It's my mission to share this to the world as I work on this since 20 years. So I have a lot to share. If someone likes to do this step, I will support you if you have questions for free. It's just my heart on that. So bless you all and thank you. Well, thank you. I think we will leave it like this in the space and uh, maybe you can use the time to hear one or two more voices. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, Andrea, over to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Thomas. The, um, the words and the silence both I've found so healing and uh, uplifting. Um, I, as I'm sure many people here do, work with students and uh, we had a huge gift. I work in the university uh, in that um, along with the very terrible things that happened, we were able to start one day a week. We began last autumn teaching in Epping Forest taking the whole group to the forest mm, nice. and uh, <laughs> no um and i mean that's been a passion just i resonate with a lot that nela was saying there it's been my personal passion i have this ludicrous commute to work every day but i just hang out the window and 10 years ago i would d fill up on the the foxes or the rabbits or the wildlife that i saw and it's diminished, 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 diminished. But what I really was interested in, and I'd love to hear you speak about, is the place that um, the arts and creativity can play can play in this. So there's a there's a for me a very socioeconomic um, gap of when I take my very diverse group of students to the forest. Some are like, oh great, because my parents had this house in the country as I was growing up. And for many, many people like the poet Audre Lorde, you know, they grow up cherishing the grass that grew through the cracks in the concrete. And uh, a, a beautiful young woman from um, Peckham uh, came in tears in the middle of COVID and grabbed my hands and put her face in my face and said, I've written my first poem in three years and I have found something necessary to my life and I didn't know it existed. I wondered if you could talk to us a little bit about any actions that we can take um, to engage people, younger people and socioeconomically deprived people to connect them in that way you speak about so beautifully when you say, you know, we are, we are the forest. Mm. Yeah, first of all, I, I, what you already mentioned, that I think art, art and creative processes are like one of our superpowers, you know, dealing with trauma. So like creating rituals and creating artistic rituals. And, and I've learned about this a lot through my wife, who is a passionate artist and a teacher at the university and an international artist. So the, like when I see her work with her students, like how she manages to touch the intelligence of the trauma and transform it into creative expression. That's amazing. And so, and when, so that's why I think that, um, especially because artistic expression, if it's poetry, if it's music, if it's drawing, if it's sculpturing, you know, like, writing like it it activates a part in us and i think that 
a support for for that as a as a form of trauma intervention is definitely very very uh, strong and and also i think is applicable in various socioeconomic structures because you know not everybody can afford like a high highly trained trauma therapist every week but um but we can we can create spaces and rituals and the other part is that we support like i often speak about like we have individual skill building like at a very high level trauma trained therapist is is a is a high level individual skill building but we also have to upgrade our collective skill building and studying how individual and collective interdependence, which means I, I look at individuals as a specific expression of the system, of the living system. So an individual is not a separate particle. An individual is a specific expression of the whole. And if so there is an interdependent dynamic between the whole and the individual. So I cannot just look at the individual alone and say something about its health, for example. I need to see it as a part of a whole and say something meaningful about the, the individual within the context. And, um, and so when we, when we look at how to, to develop traumatizing, that's also what we do in the poker project, is looking in our trauma trainings is looking how to come from traumatizing societies to trauma aware or informed trauma sensitive so that we already have some sensitivity in us that we start to feel those things to trauma integrating or trauma restorative societies so these are levels of collective coherence building and the higher the collective coherence becomes the stronger is the healing power of the system because the coherence is the force that has the power to integrate the fragmentation if the coherence is too low the fragmenting power is simply taking over all the time but if the coherence is higher it has the power to reduce the fragmentation and so how can we induce or support local community building that is trauma informed that communities can acquire certain competencies they don't need to be a super trained trauma therapist because that's needed for a certain complexity of trauma but the collective competence and the some witnessing capacities listening capacities ways ritualized ways of speaking with each other and listening to each other and creating spaces where we can co-regulate with each other. We notice trauma triggers and we don't take them immediately personal. These are capacities that we can learn as society in order to disarm, in a way, slowly, the recurrent cycle of trauma. And, and I think if we, if we invested more in, in, you know, what are the individual and the we skills that we need for that, then we can support many local communities in areas that that people that are interested in that, and this they become local support systems, the resource self resourcing, and then we you know we build it through training or skill building. It's like if if nobody in the community has a first aid course, if there is an injured person on the road. It's terrible because nobody knows what to do. But if there are a few people, like everybody who has a driver's license has a first aid course, at least there are a few people that can do the necessary thing until the ambulance comes. And, and I think we can think about um, trauma skills also on the collective level and definitely arts and, and creative processes are part of it to um, strengthen it. So I would think about what are the communities or the skills we can teach or can um, provide to jumpstart such, you know, self-supportive systems or self-resourcing systems. 
that is one idea. I mean, there's so much more to say to your question, but maybe that's one thing I can say. Well, that's beautiful and it's very helpful. Thank you very, mm -hmm. very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you so much, Thomas. Unfortunately, we've reached the end of our time. You know, I was, uh, yeah, and there are definitely a few questions and topics in the space that would be lovely to still address. So I'm just really happy to know that this is an ongoing conversation that we are having. Mm. And yeah, there was also a real question from, unfortunately, I don't know how to say her name, but Katja in the in the chat about how these practices might just be for privileged people, this way of seeing the world or approaching how it might not see the way that, yeah, people who suffered most are living and the experience fully. I don't know whether you might end just with two, three sentences around that or acknowledging and then we'll hand it over to Eva, who will lead us into half an hour of silence, reflection, coherence building to end our day. But yeah, I think we to that. I think we certainly uh, have to always listen to, you know, what I, I forgot the name of the comment said, like that there are always perspectives that might not be included or might not be included yet. And I think that's always a valid exploration that we, like, who are the voices that are not sitting here? It's Kacha Camila is how I would say the name. So I'm not <laughs> sure I'm pronouncing Kacha it. Camila. Okay, so I think it's a very important question that we are always exploring, like who is not represented in, in what's being shared. And I think that's very important. And, and also that like, I think certain dynamics, like there's some kind of universality also to trauma, however we describe it and which language we use and which approach to heal trauma. And I think that's where we can learn from every culture around the world, because, you know, every cultural tradition has a kind of a healing system developed. And now, of course, we are, we are very much into modern medicine, but there are many other um, healing systems that we can learn of and also learn of their understanding of trauma or their understanding of collective resonance or coherence building. And so I think it's, it's a longer question. I think I need to speak more about it, but definitely I, I hear the comment and I take it uh, seriously. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Katja Camila. And I think the other comment that I read that I just, you know, is people just really asking, how does this approach actually lead to practical action and implementation, you know, and just to say, you know, I can experience it in my life, how over the years of work, doing this work, how it increases the ability to manifest new structures. So, yeah. That's right. And sorry, Kusha, and, no. and it, it starts now because the, the practical application is not, we are not waiting for it. Like if we take it seriously, what we spoke about today, then we walk away and whatever we do, whatever is our impact and however we do it, informed by what we speak, we can all practice that. We can all practice to become more aware of fragmenting or unification or separation and interdependence. We can all become more aware of our own trauma triggers, our own shutdown, our own self-respect. How do I look at myself? Through which lens am I looking at myself? And then how do I apply this to others? So there are so many, so many practices that we can take away from today that we can take into any kind of workflow, whatever is your profession, uh, it can be applied immediately. So the action happens yeah. through all of us uh, using it. And I'm just seeing that Katja Camila also responded. Thank you, Kasha and Thomas for answering. I really thank you and all. And also, yeah, just, 
You know, I, I loved what you brought tonight, especially also about these fine nuances of distancing. And yeah, I, I, I just love how also in these calls, many new people are joining and this having an experience that, you know, all of this is welcome and yeah, melting closer. Just very much appreciating what you brought tonight, Thomas, and loving this journey that we're on. And I know that you will be leading our 12 p.m. UK, the midday meditation on Sunday. And we're starting a global social witnessing practice in the afternoon leading up. Also, you will be leading a global social witnessing afternoon in the afternoon of Monday. So I really welcome people to come back for that. And tomorrow evening, we will also be hearing from Charles Eisenstein. So do come back for that. And with that, Thomas, thank and you. Thank you, Kosha and Anne and Scott for holding the space here. And uh, yeah, thank you everybody for holding a space for our conversation tonight and for being engaged and, mm -hmm. uh, with us. And so thank you. Bye bye. <laughs> yeah, be well. Thank you. Mm -hmm.